Now here's your host, Tom Dorado. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Eddie Sutton Show. You recall last week we told you that the Cowboys were getting ready to start the toughest stretch, really, of the season. Four road games and six Big 12 outings. Eddie, we found out just how tough this past week it is when you have to go pay a visit to somebody else's house. Well, we uh, didn't play as well as uh, we have at times down at OU, and uh, they played a sensational game. Uh, Nahara really just had a, a great game for them, and we get beat 72-65 get behind early and then make a real run and just can't get over the hump. Uh, the opposite is true out in Colorado. We get out and have numerous chances to break the game wide open and uh, just don't seize that opportunity. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, we can't stop the avalanche there at the end. We're up 75 to 60 with seven minutes to go and get beat 83 to 80. That has never happened to me in my 40 years of coaching where I've, we've lost games, but not when you had a lead that late in a ball game and it was a a very hurtful loss, let's put it that way. I know since we've been back, you've heard it, the question. I've been asked the question. Our post-game interview certainly spurred a lot of interest and concern amongst Cowboy fans when you said, hey, maybe it's time for you to hang it up. Obviously, you're here on the show, so you haven't decided to do that. I probably would have hung it up right after that game if I'd have had a chance, but uh, you know, I'm not going to run out on these kids. Uh, we've still got a lot of games to play. If I had to very many losses like that one, believe me, I would be uh, doing something else. But uh, no, I, I, I was very frustrated because it was a game, and very seldom, uh, I think you can go back and trace my coaching career, have we ever lost games that uh, we were supposed to win? And that's happened to us two or three times this year, and uh, it's not a good feeling. Uh, we've always been a, a program that uh, we won most of the games we should and upset some people along the way. And this ball club this year hasn't been able to do that. And it is very frustrating for our coaching staff. And I know it's very frustrating for our fans as well. Well, there were some solid performances last week. We're going to get right to the highlight package after this opening timeout. Hello. We are back and welcome. You know, Eddie, it was obvious over the last two games this past week, Pete's broken out of that scoring slump. He is now the third all-time scorer in school history at 1,670 points. And, again, that has to be good for you to see Pete heating it up. Well, it is. He was 19 out of 33 from the field in the two uh, games this week. And, you know, he, he, uh, there's been a lot of great players at Oklahoma State, but just to think that he's third in all-time scoring, that, that's, that's a remarkable feat. Uh, right in there behind Byron Houston and, and Bryant Reeves. How about passing a legend like Bob Curlin as he did out of Colorado? Well, you know, Curlin was one of the first great big players we had in the game. And uh, I told Pete uh, on a return trip from Boulder, I said, you know, I'm so pleased and proud of you. You hit 27 points and you go into third place, but this is one game yeah. that uh, you'll long remember that it was, even though I had a great performance, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. Well, here we go as you talk. And we talked about Frederick uh, after the game as being one of the bright spots along with Pete uh, in the game against Oklahoma. I thought Frederick, uh, for a freshman, came into a very uh, tough situation. You know, it was the largest crowd ever to see a basketball game at the University of Oklahoma, and he came in there and really held his poise, competed, and, uh, you know, they zoned us, and like it was in the first meeting here, we had a hard time attacking the zone like you need to. We didn't have good dribble penetration. Uh, we didn't get the ball inside uh, like we should and we got behind. Then once we started uh, running our zone offense properly uh, and uh, we got that, that dribble penetration, we got the ball into the heart of the defense and when they collapsed we kicked it back out for perimeter shooting. Uh, all of a sudden we, we, we're riding the ball game and, and uh, it's a nice follow shot. We run a, a free throw play there on missed free throws and when Pete's active, doing things like that, getting rebounds, putting the ball on the floor, getting inside the arc, and just making that defense have to really honor him in all forms, that's when he's most effective. Well, you know, as for instance, he had 12 rebounds in the two games, and uh, you're exactly right. When he's active and he's putting the ball on the floor and he's just not content to shoot perimeter shots, uh, he's a much better basketball player. And here, what was the halftime message? As bad as we had played in the opening session, we made a run, got it back to uh, certainly into a manageable area. 
We missed three dead layups in the first half. We're down 31 to 22. So, you know, if you hit those, it's 31 to 28. And uh, at the beginning of the second half, they spurted out on us again. Mm -hmm. And then you, there's, there's good dribble penetration, good, good offensive board play there. There's Doug penetrating again. And there's Desmond Mason uh, following up on the missed shot. You can see the uh, replay here, but you, you guys practice against this every day. All these principles that you see here are, are, are taught and pushed and stressed every day in practice. For some reason, they don't get carried out in the game. Well, they do at times. I, I, that's a thing that has just baffled the coaching staff, uh, is that uh, we, we play in spurts. I mean, we'll, we'll play and play well and do all the things you do in practice that allow you a chance to win a game. And all of a sudden we get real passive and we're not as aggressive and uh, at both ends of the floor, not only offensively, but defensively as well. See, I think Joe that's the one thing that's uh, really uh, been a mystery to us this year is that we just haven't put together a 40-minute game. You know, you're always going to have runs by both teams and you try to curtail the run by the other ball club as quickly as you can. You try to extend the run when you're on it. Naha Raw, as I said, had a great game, 19 points, 17 rebounds, and he was really the one, I think, that spearheaded the, the win for Oklahoma. Yeah. Joe, he came alive there in the second half and hit some big shots for us. We pulled up to six points uh, on three different occasions in the last seven minutes, and each time uh, Naha Raw hit two trays and, uh, and Martin hit one, and uh, we just couldn't get over the hump. Well, because Joe had brought us back, but indeed, Nahara had a career game, no question. He followed it up with a big game at Texas as well. So, I mean, I, obviously, you got to give credit where it's due, but Cowboys hung right there, and just except for there's that shot by Martin. You know, I've been here nine years, and uh, we've swept Oklahoma several times, and uh, this is the first time they had beaten us in both games. So, uh, hopefully, that won't happen again. Strange day in Boulder. You see, it was 70 degrees in the afternoon, and there's Pete and uh, heading into the uh, arena and it's snowing uh, in, in about a space of six or seven hours. Well, we got in there uh, the night before the game. It was beautiful and then uh, all day long, like you said, and then all of a sudden the front came through and it was miserable and we had a rough trip coming back from Boulder. Indeed. Uh, those trips aren't any fun anyway uh, in rough weather, but when you've taken a loss like we did, it's even worse. You can't ask for a better, uh, we've been talking and begging for starts all year. You can't ask for a better start. You've got the home team down by 17, about seven minutes into the game. 25 to eight, and we uh, can't play any better than what we played. Uh, executed well, hit open shots like that one. Defense was very good. We forced them into turnovers. Uh, the, the shots that they were getting weren't good shots. And they weren't running the floor like they like to. You see Janssen keeping the ball alive. And they weren't getting to the free throw line until about eight minutes left in the first half. Well, we fouled too much. I think they ended up shooting 41 free throws. They hit 32 of them. And uh, anytime you look at a ball club and they get that many free throws, you know that uh, uh, you may be aggressive, but you're committing some, some uh, fouls that you shouldn't be committing. You know, the, the halves almost mirrored each other, Eddie, as, as we jumped out. Early in the first half, they came back and made something of it at, at halftime, a six-point deficit they were trailing. Then another good seven, eight minutes to start the second half. We blew out on them the second half, and uh, it just looked like, it, you know, if you just really lay down for two or three more minutes and, and, and push the lead into 18, 20 points, the game's going to be over because they're not going to be able to recover. And we didn't do that. We let them come back, and uh, credit to their ball club. Boy, they competed hard uh, down the stretch. I think the biggest disappointment to me was uh, our defense just collapsed and fouled walls too much. He had 18 out of 20 free throws. I don't believe I ever had a player on the other team hit that many free throws. Well, he certainly led that free throw barrage down the stretch. And you talk about free throws. We've been having a, a nice run of free throws the last half dozen games, up around 70%. And I've heard you say it once, I've heard you say it a thousand times. You can extend, maintain a lead by hitting free throw. We're the, uh, you know, the leader in the Big 12 as far as the team percentage shooting free throws. And yet in this ball game, we go 13 for 27, they go 32 for 41. We outscore them six field goals. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's no way, there's so many ways you, you look back at this ball game that uh, if you just do one or two things, uh, even giving them credit, hitting some big shots late in the ball game, uh, that you're not going to win. And I guess that's what probably uh, was so frustrating and so disappointing to all of us. Because of the games we had remaining, we felt like uh, the three road games 
We still have to go to Kansas. We still have to go to Nebraska, two teams that certainly are going to be in the upper division. That this would be the easiest game for us to win. And we got three games left at home with uh, Texas, uh, Texas Tech, and uh, Missouri. So I think from that standpoint and the way it played out earlier in the week, there were some other upsets. Uh, you know, we, we blew a game, but uh, you can look at Kansas. They had a big lead late in the game against mm -hmm. Nebraska at home and lose. Texas has a lead on uh, the University of Oklahoma late in Austin, and they lose. And by winning this ball game, uh, we're right there in the chase. And uh, I think that's what was so frustrating to all of us. But you can't look back. That's the thing that, you know, losers do that. Winners look ahead and say, hey, we got beat. Now we've got games ahead of us. And that's what we're going to be doing is uh, getting ready for the Longhorns who we host on Sunday. And you talked about the Cowboys being up. That's the 15th. This is, this is when we got up right. 75 to 60, and there's a little over seven minutes to go. And, uh, you know, it just looks like the game's over. But it wasn't over. I'm glad you didn't show anything. <laughs> so we didn't have to talk about that parade to the free throw line. That game's in the past now. Two tough games. Uh, back home against Texas, we're going to talk about the Longhorns in a little bit. But the overall psyche of the team, you've been able to meet with them a couple of times since that game. Well, I think uh, young men probably recover sometimes quicker than older men do, but I think they uh, they understand that uh, we've kind of dug a hole for ourselves. We're behind the eight ball, and, and we just got to go out and beat some people. We've got to go you know, beat people that maybe we shouldn't beat. We lost the game. We should have won. Now we've got to go beat someone that uh, probably they'll be favored to win. Well, we're going to take you back to happier days as far as Oklahoma State basketball history is concerned. A blast from the past on this week's Off the Court Feature. Don't go away. We're back, and let's get right to the notebook. As usual, we have some items for your discussion, and our first item is where is he, and that has to do with uh, all the officials didn't show up down in Norman. Ed Hightower was kind of missing in action. Ed I Hightower comes from uh, Illinois, and he flies, flies in a private plane, and uh, because of the bad weather, he didn't get there to the University of Oklahoma game until halftime. In fact, when we got to the arena, they only had one official. So they were really trying to find where can we get some of some other officials. Well, they got Charlie Green, who lives in Oklahoma City, who had worked the Texas A&M game that afternoon. So he worked the first half. Hightower works the second half. Never had seen that happen before. We get to Colorado, another official is a no-show, but they ended up reassigning someone else. So, you know, with the weather like it is, sometimes it's tough getting there. You know, the one thing that there was an article in the uh, Tulsa World this week, there are a lot of us that think officials are working too many games, mm -hmm. and as a result, you know, they're just not quite as sharp as they need to be. This is something I think that uh, supervisors and commissioners need to take a long look at. It's coming up on Big 12 tournament time. People want to be refreshed. And well, how do they seed them? How in the world do they go through this system? Well, of course, the team that wins the uh, round robin is seeded number one. And the team in the other division, whether it be uh, the north or the south, they get the second seed. And then the third and fourth seeds go to whichever teams have the best record, regardless of whether it's the Northern Division or the Southern Division. And of course, this next item has to do with fighting. And it seems like the emotions sometimes get carried away in some conferences, especially this time of the year when a lot's at stake. What is the rule about fighting? Well, if you're involved in fighting and you get ejected from a game, then you are automatically suspended for the, for the next game. And if it happens again, I think you're suspended for the season. Okay, Texas is in town. Sunday afternoon now, those people who are getting out of their pattern a little bit. Sunday afternoon, 12.30 tip-off at gallagher Iber Arena. And neither team's going to be in a very good mood because both are coming off losses. Well, the University of Texas uh, had a, a sizable lead late in the game in Austin uh, in their last outing, and the University of Oklahoma made a, a great comeback and beat them by one point. So I know they're not going to be in a good mood. And, of course, Texas has maybe as good a starting lineup as anyone in the Big 12 and has a great center in Mims and uh, Maneki and Clack. Those three guys, Vasquez, boy, those four are really quality players. Uh, but people are going to have to go to church early and, and get out and get over to Gallagher Alba and help us beat those Longhorns. We own one. Well, this week's Internet question from OakState.com is presented by Southwestern Bell. And the question has to do with, and this would be a tough one, Philip. This would be a tough one for him to find out, yeah? When you have coached as long as I have, I've had some memorable games and exciting games. And that one we saw earlier when uh, we beat Kansas in 95, that was a great game. But, you know, I'll just go this route. This is an easy way out. When we went to the Final Four, we beat three quality ball clubs, Alabama, Wake Forest with Tim Duncan, 
And then to get to the Final mm -hmm. Four in Seattle, we beat a great Massachusetts team, a team the following year that went to the Final Four. And, you know, all three of those teams, in my opinion, were as good as UCLA, the team that beat us out. But I've had a lot of pleasant memories and some great wins along the way. Well, if you have a question for Eddie Sutton that you want answered on the show, log on to Oklahoma State's official athletic website at oakstate.com. Participate in the Southwestern Bell Ask Coach Sutton contest in the short time that we have left. Now, again, early tip-off, 1230 Sunday. The Longhorns and then another tough road trip uh, midweek uh, to the University of Nebraska, a team that did something this that I didn't think uh, they'd ever done. Maybe they have, but they beat Kansas two games, so they're playing about as well as anyone. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's show. Join us again next week for Eddie Sutton, our entire crew here at Educational Television Services. Tom Dorado. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>